no one had more faith in America than I did as a little girl. I can recall standing before my Girl Scout troop leader with my chest lifted high, reciting with pride the Pledge of Allegiance with liberty and justice for all. Those weren't just words to me. I had bought in a hook, line, and sinker, and I believed I could do anything and be anything if I worked hard and got a good education. Some might say that I've accomplished some noteworthy things in my life, like writing a national policing proposal that would put into play every day throughout America the Department of Justice's most potent tool for curtailing abusive policing known as the Pattern of Practice Investigation. There's also the constitutional case that I, a non-attorney, wrote, which a U.S. appeals court labeled novel. The case presents a first-of-its-kind legal argument for unseating a president who was elected with the help of foreign computer hackers. Despite my accomplishments, I can't help but wonder what other things might I have achieved had my life not been littered with races hell-bent on sending me down paths I never intended to go. Like the detour that forever changed my life 20 years ago. It all began with a green and gold brochure, which I left behind after marketing my company to the Internal Revenue Service unaffectionately known as IRS. Every year, the federal government spends over $500 billion to purchase all types of goods and services. And I wanted the writing company, my company, to have a piece of that huge financial pie. One day, while sitting at my desk, a call came in. The person on the line said she was from Internal Revenue Service and was searching IRS vendor files for a company that could rewrite complicated tax documents. She said, your firm's brochure caught my eye. Can you tell me more about your services? I obliged, and the second I hung up the phone, my staff and I went into action and we made sure that she had our company's capability statement and client reference list in her hands by end of day. A week later, I was walking the halls of IRS in Washington, D.C. towards a meeting with top agency executives. When I entered the room, I was greeted with compliments. My customers had apparently given us excellent recommendations. We began discussing the project at hand, and I learned that the IRS Notice Redesign Project was part of the clinton Gore administration's plain writing effort. And the goal of the project was to make IRS's complex taxpayer notices easy to read, easy to understand, and visually appealing to the millions of taxpayers who received them. The discussion then turned to my firm's capabilities, after which one executive said, Gerald, you sound impressive, but show us what you can do. He said, I want you to rewrite two of IRS's most complex notices without our help and get them back to us by Friday. I delivered them on Wednesday. In my follow-up meeting with IRS executives a week later, I learned that the agency had circulated our sample notices far and wide, and everyone, I mean everyone, liked them. I began my presentation on our sample notices by pointing out the changes that we had made and the reasons for the changes. I also talked about what we needed to meet IRS's rapidly approaching deadline. IRS Executive John Del Wimple said, Gerald, you have the contract, but only if you agree to serve as project manager. He then turned to the contracting manager and said, I want you to give her direct access to everyone at IRS, and I mean everyone, which included the agency's highest executives. Another executive said, if you perform this contract successfully, everyone in the nation will know your name. If you don't perform successfully, everyone in the nation will know your name. Everyone chuckled and the meeting ended. To say I was ecstatic about getting the contract would be an understatement. 
But I wasn't the only person brimming with excitement about the multi-million dollar contract award, considered to be the most coveted writing project in the nation. For decades, the Small Business Administration had sought to help black businesses get the type of high-profile contract I had just landed. The people at SBA were familiar with the writing company, and they knew that my firm would shoulder the load. But first, there had to be a contract, and there could be no contract without a scope of work. Since IRS had no idea how to write the scope of work, the agency turned to me for help. With the contract almost set to go, IRS officials decided they wanted to showcase the redesigned notices we produced in a really big way. So they added to the contract a provision that called for me, President Clinton, and Vice President Gore to host a national town hall meeting to unveil the new notices. But that town hall meeting would never be, not if Treasury executives had their way. With the contract signed, the project was off to a great start. We were performing on time, under budget, and continuing to get outstanding written evaluations from reviewers up and down IRS's personnel chain. But then I began to hear rumblings that Treasury didn't want a black firm to have the high profile contract. Less than two months in, I found myself sitting in Treasury Executive Nancy Killifer's office waiting for a meeting to start. While I suspected the outcome might not be good, never in my wildest imaginations could I have anticipated the scheme Killifer and Treasury Executive Lisa Ross McGonigal had concocted to rid IRS of me, the black contractor. Most people would call what I was about to experience racism or discrimination but I call it a full-on racial assault and battery. It didn't take long after the meeting with Treasury started for Killifer and Ross to let me know that they were not fans of the writing company's notices. Their opinions were quite different from the exceptionally positive feedback we were getting every day from IRS reviewers. But Treasury oversees IRS, so Ross and Killifer were calling the shots. Ross and Killifer claimed that the goal of the meeting was to make sure IRS was getting the best notices possible. And then they shared their plan. I was to hand over my firm's notices to two firms, both of which were my competitors, that Ross and Killifer had selected. The competitors would then use our notices to try to produce better notice. And then a research firm, also hired by Ross and Killifer, would hold nationwide focus groups to compete the three firms' notices in order to determine which firm's notices taxpayers like best. With the plan defined, Killifer and Ross laid out the rules of the competition. The writing company, my firm, could only make changes that IRS was able to recreate using its existing computer systems. Also, my firm's notices had to be in black and white. Our competitors, however, had absolutely no restrictions. They could even create their notices in color if they wanted. When the focus group results came in, we learned that taxpayers across the nation like our notices the best. But rather than allaying Treasury's concerns, our performance made Ross and Killifer even more determined to rid IRS of its black contractor, no matter the cost. Without explanation, IRS started to gut our scope of work. The national town hall meeting with President Clinton and Vice President Gore was removed. Focus groups I was contracted to conduct in Puerto Rico were nixed. A big share of our notice redesign work was deleted. The work process I designed to stave off sabotage and stay on schedule was stripped away. 
Despite all the chaos, all the nonstop interventions, and constant timeline changes, my firm continued to perform with no faults and no failures. Out of the blue, IRS scheduled a site inspection. A week later, the agency flew seven people from Washington, D.C. to our office in St. Louis, Missouri. The IRS team entered our facility like the German Gestapo. They demanded copies of every notice we had drafted, access to our company's financial records, and access to our computer systems that contained other clients' data. My attorney demanded that the team leave my office and not return until IRS had put in writing the reason for its visit. He said, I'm not going to allow IRS to conduct a fishing expedition. At the end of the four-day ordeal, that included meals and hotel rooms paid for by taxpayers, IRS reported that the inspection revealed no negative findings. Years later, I learned that weeks before flying the team to St. Louis, IRS attorneys had been scouring internal files on the writing company to find a reason to end the contract. A briefing paper prepared by IRS attorneys on the matter said, among other things, there has been a clear violation of implied authority on the part of the government. The contract does not have documentation to reflect dissatisfaction of the performance by the government or documentation that the writing company has breached any of the contract terms and conditions. It is our opinion that the following will occur if this contract is allowed to end. The writing company will file a claim against the government. The writing company will notify their congressmen and a congressional inquiry will follow. The writing company will protest award to another contractor for the accomplishment of these services. This office stands ready to support the decision that is made as to the future of the writing company's contract. A few weeks after the site inspection, an IRS contracting manager told me to come to Washington. He said, oh, and be sure to bring your attorney. During that meeting, the contracting manager turned to me and said, we're terminating your contract for convenience of the government, effective immediately. He casually added, that IRS hasn't used the wartime termination for convenience clause, also known as a T for C, to end a contract in 20 years. The SBA representative tied into the meeting via phone said, this is no way to conduct a termination. Days later, SBA communicated its deep dissatisfaction with the termination in writing and noted that IRS had said the writing company performed without deficiency. Weeks later, IRS was back on the market looking for a firm to provide notice redesign services. The exact same services my company had been providing without deficiency. This time, however, the request for proposal had a strange requirement that placed the contract outside of the reach of most small businesses but not the writing company. We responded with what turned out to be the winning proposal. But just as we entered into discussions with IRS about the new requirement, it was canceled and the notice redesign work disappeared from the federal contracting landscape, or so it seemed. With the government's bad faith on full display, I began openly challenging IRS's actions. IRS in turn started making good on its promise to put me out of business. The agency kept hundreds of thousands of dollars I was owed, had my firm audited three times, initiated a Department of Labor wage investigation that could have cost me hundreds of thousands of dollars. The agency also carried out secret investigations that sent federal agents to my employees' homes at night and my customers' businesses by day. In one of its most vicious attacks, 
federal agents descended upon my office in surprise fashion and issued me a subpoena to appear before a grand jury on made-up criminal charges. When all the dust settled, my firm was found to be without flaw. But by then, the company that I'd worked day and night for eight years to build into a nationally recognized writing powerhouse that served Fortune 500 companies like Union Pacific, Anheuser-Busch, Monsanto Corporation, Marriott Corporation, and countless other corporations and government entities was now struggling to survive. I looked everywhere for help. I turned to President Clinton, Vice President Gore, Treasury head Lawrence Somers, top IRS officials, the U.S. Attorney General, Treasury and IRS Inspector Generals, Justice Department, every federal investigative agency I could find, the Black Caucus, and congressional leaders. I also reached out to newspapers and to broadcast stations, but no one seemed to care about my horrific racial assault. Not like they do when the white woman cries assault. By that time, I had boxes of incriminating documents straight from IRS's files. Documents that confirmed there was a plan early on to take my contract and give it to someone else. Documents that confirmed that IRS and Treasury were taking every step possible to put my small firm out of business. I just knew my incredible evidentiary file would be a game changer. But that was not the case at all. Every avenue that should have been open to me was closed. Courts that were legally bound to review my breach of contract claims refused to hear them. Nothing I did or said moved the needle. Not even a scathing 12-page report prepared by court adjudicated experts in federal contracting after their seven month independent investigation. The report, which I repeatedly sent to the Department of Justice Public Corruption Unit, told of the conspiracy to take my firm's contract, the plan to give it to an associate of treasury executives, and the millions of federal dollars spent covering up the illegal contracting actions. Nancy Killifer, Lisa Ross, and those who aided them ripped my life to shreds. The damage to my employees and my family is incalculable. Justice matters. It cleanses the soul of the injured party, holds abusers accountable, and gives rise to a national community where equity and fair play rules. The writing company was as good as they get. And I, not Lisa Ross McGonigal, not Nancy Killifer, should have been free to sit in my director's chair and script my life story. I should have been able to run the same race as other federal contractors, governed by the same rules, eligible for the same rewards. Instead, every day I live with the knowledge that someone else is making millions from my work while the firm I labored so hard to build lay in ruins. <laughs>